right, next, um, we do, Jerome has not made it, but I think uh, Dan Wertheimer is going to give his talk or a pan said, Pano said he talk. So Dan, take it away. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Dan Wertheimer at Berkeley, and unfortunately, Jerome uh, couldn't make it uh, today. Jerome Mayer is, and Shelley Wright are the main brains behind this project uh, called Pano SETI. Shelley's the PI. Uh, Jerome's been doing a, lo a lot of the work, um, but I'm taking the credit today. So um, Jerome, unfortunately, uh, is sick. He is um, uh, luckily not COVID. It's, I think it's just uh, food poisoning. Um, so this project I want to tell you about is called Pano SETI, which is pulsed all sky near infrared optical SETI. We're trying to do an all sky all the time search to look for rare signals that might flash once an hour, once a day, once a month, once a year. Um, the problem with the SETI optical SETI and infrared SETI that we've been doing uh, to date has been that we look at a little tiny piece of the sky at a time, uh, a millionth of the sky. It's looking like looking through a straw that's 30 feet long, 10, 10 meters long. And so if we're looking in one place in the sky and they're flashing over in the other place, in another place, we're going to miss them. So uh, we want to cover a big chunk of the sky simultaneously. And that's what the Pano SETI project is, is about, to look for kind of rare signals, pulse signals in optical and infrared. And it's a project of uh, UC San Diego, UC Berkeley, Harvard, and, uh, and Caltech. Um, so this is what we, we hope to build. It's got 100 telescopes poking out of a geodesic dome. Each telescope covers about 100 square degrees. So together, uh, one dome covers about 10,000 square degrees. And we hope to have several domes at different places on the Earth so we can cover the whole sky all the time. Uh, We'll have two domes at, at a single observatory about a kilometer apart. We need two domes uh, to uh, distinguish between uh, false alarms and flashes from ET or astrophysical phenomena. Cherenkov radiation happens in our own atmosphere when a high energy particle enters the atmosphere. It can cause these flashes of light. But with two domes a kilometer apart, we can reject these uh, flashes because they're with parallax. We can kind of triangulate on them. And, and reject the things in our own atmosphere. As far as we know, there are no other sources uh, uh, analogous to RFI and the radio that cause these flashes. Um, and so if we find something, it'll be interesting either way. It'll be ET or something new astrophysical. This is the search space we're trying to cover with Panoceti. Uh, so you can see we're looking at kind of nanosecond time scales out to about a second um, time scale. After a few seconds, there are other searches that are fairly wide field and uh, can detect phenomena at uh, a second or above LSST and some other wide field searches. Uh, look at typical integration times of most sky surveys are 15 seconds to minutes to hours. Uh, so they're not sensitive to nanosecond time scale events or millisecond or microsecond time scale events. And that's where Panosetti really shines. It shines in solid angle coverage and shines in uh, these short time scales, nanosecond, millisecond, microsecond time scales at, at visible and near infrared wavelengths. So optical SETI has been around for a long time. In, in 61, uh, Schwartz and Towns proposed uh, SETI. Of course, Towns invented the laser and we worked closely with Charlie. His office was right next to mine and we worked on a bunch of optical SETI searches together. Um, at the time that uh, that Schwartz and Towns proposed this, lasers were little dinky things, so nobody really paid any attention to this um, paper. Um, in, in 61, the, if you put the, a laser, the biggest laser on the, the biggest telescope, Palomar, um, you could get out to uh, maybe a tenth of a light year, uh, nowhere near the nearest star. Uh, but of course now, lasers are uh, 10 to the 15 watts, and if you put that on a uh, 10, 10 meter telescope like Keck, and we're about to have 30 meter telescopes, you can outshine the sun and the entire optical band by a factor of 3000, which is visible out to a thousand light years. I think now it's even better. You can go across the galaxy. Uh, so optical SETI is very good for point to point communication. I don't think we would discover them if, if they didn't shine a laser in our direction. I think unlike radio, radio is good for sort of omnidirectional. You can imagine somebody analogous to TV or the BMU's radars or something that 
point in all directions off their planet. We could discover an artifact of their technology. I think uh, optical and infrared are better for point to point, high bandwidth communication. They know about us. They know about other civilizations. They're talking together with lasers. Uh, and um, the last little bit is about um, this distinguishable. It's easily distinguishable from the background and the noise. Um, if you see a 10 nano, if you see 10 photons hitting you in a nanosecond, that never happens from a star. So it's a very simple experiment. You just ask, do I see 10 photons in a nanosecond? That is an interesting event. Either some new astrophysics or ET, you get the Nobel Prize either way. Uh, in the infrared, you can go through the uh, dust in the galaxy at visible wavelengths. You can't go through the dust in the galaxy, but if you look outside of the plane, you can see other stars and other galaxies. So in optical SETI, uh, most optical SETI searches are looking for a signal that's compressed in time. You get a lot of uh, photons in a very short time, a nanosecond or a few nanoseconds or a microsecond. That's what makes it unusual. In radio SETI, most of the searches that we and other people have done are looking for signals that are compressed in frequency. You do a spectrographic search. Uh, and uh, so you have to sort of know what frequency. Um, and uh, you, so whether a signal is compressed in time or frequency, either one makes it interesting. A narrow band signal that's not thermally broadened is not, is not astrophysical or a signal that's <clears throat> where you have a few photons, several photons in a nanosecond. There's no natural phenomena that we know can create that. Um, so we've been working on this uh, since the 90s. Uh, Harvard has been working on this. This is a, a, on the right, you see a picture of the Harvard search um, using these photomultiplier tubes. These were targeted searches, these early searches that we and others have done. Um, and the reason you couldn't cover a big area of the sky is because these photomultiplier tubes that we use cost $1,000 a piece. So every pixel on the sky was $1,000. That's what made, that's changed. So we did these, uh, this is the Lick optical SETI thing with a couple of these photomultiplier tubes. This is uh, the new kind of detectors that uh, Jerome has been working on in the near infrared search. Jerome is here. He's the guy that's supposed to be giving this talk. Um, and these things are, um, uh, oh, this is the thing at, at Lick Observatory. This is the targeted search. Um, and, uh, and this is on the nickel 40 inch telescope uh, and it's running almost every clear night. And it's been doing that for many years, looking at these uh, nearby stars. And the problem with it, as I mentioned, is that, I don't know if you can see this little dot moving around, but we typically look at a place in the sky for about five minutes, but it, while we're looking, if it's flashing somewhere else, uh, we'll, we'll miss them. Uh, so we wanted to do an all sky, all the time search. What's made this possible are these, uh, a radical new detector that's come out in the last few years. Uh, these are silicon photomultiplier tubes. And instead of a thousand dollars a pixel, they're $5 a pixel. And uh, so we can tile the sky with these things. Each one of these things is three millimeters across. What makes them cheap is they're used in positron emission tomography, PET scanning machines that are in a, a lot of hospitals. And they, they, uh, you swallow a radioactive dye and, and uh, where they wanna pinpoint the cancer, the dye goes to where the cancer is and the radioactive particles come out and these detectors can detect the, the flashes and pinpoint where the cancer is growing. And that's what made these things uh, cheap, these PET scan machines. Another thing that's made our search cheap is that we use very inexpensive lenses. This is Shelley Wright behind the Fresnel lens that we use, the half meter diameter uh, Fresnel lens in the telescope. And so here you see uh, 256 of these pixels and we put four of these boards together to make 1,024 pixels in the focal plane here behind our Fresnel lens telescope. And so then we tile the sky. This is the plan, each telescope is a 11 and a half by 11 and a half degree field. And we have a hundred telescopes sampling 10,000 square degrees simultaneously, instantaneously. Uh, there's another little picture. Uh, this is the prototype telescope that we built that we've deployed at Lick Observatory. Um, and this is the electronics. This, uh, this is the, uh, the two telescopes with the, you can see the Fresnel lenses and the back at the back, you can't see the, elect the detectors. Um, and we've got these deployed now, not 100 telescopes, we've got two telescopes at Lick Observatory. We've been running for several months now. Luckily, we got them working 
just before COVID-19 broke out. And we've been observing almost every clear night. We call it pajama mode, remote observing. Uh, and it's looking good. The thing, the thing is working well. Uh, we can detect little flashes. We got a little fake laser signal that goes off once in a while to make sure all the software is working. And so now we want to scale this thing up now that we've demonstrated it works well. Uh, we want to deploy uh, two of these domes, but instead of two telescopes, 100 telescopes in each dome at uh, Palomar Observatory. Um, so that's what we're working on. And uh, we're optimistic about this thing in the next, getting it going in the next year or two. And that's, that's all. Thank you.